Chapter 6 Children Between Parent and Teacher The school apart from life, apart from politics, is a lie and a hypocrisy. Lennon, 1920 Discipline, it turns out, is a problem in Soviet schools, too. That is not the way it seems when foreign visitors enter a classroom and girls in their black dress and apron uniforms inherited from Tsarist times and well-scrubbed boys in bus driver gray suits rise in unison and greet guests with a chorused good morning. Nor is it what you would think watching Soviet children leaving school in the afternoon, neat, mannerly, and subdued, compared with the hectic kinetic spill-out of kids from an American suburban school singing, shouting, teasing each other, or racing in all directions with shirt tails flying. But it is what Anne and I discovered when we went to our first parent-teachers meeting at Work Polytechnical Middle School Number 30 of the Svedorlov Borough, Moscow, attended by two of our children, Lori, 11, and Jenny, 8. With about 30 other parents, we crouched in the little green wooden desks attached in pairs as in an old country schoolhouse in Jenny's school grade while the teacher, Irina Georgievna, a small brown wren of a woman, explained lessons in grammar and short division, and then read the riot act to the adults for the behavior of their children. Like all teachers, she was known by her first name and patronymic and addressed students by their last names. Ivanov A., she called out, Parental heads swung around and scanned the room until a large man in the back, looking uncomfortably out of place in his business suit, squeezed into a small green desk, raised his hand. Irina Georgievna lit into him. Your Sasha is regularly late to school, she admonished sternly. while the other parents either stared at the father or self-consciously looked away. He comes in the middle of morning exercises. We begin at 8.15 and he arrives at 8.30. You cannot be late for your work like that. If you are, you are setting your boy a bad example. We cannot have one boy disrupting our class routine like that. I have spoken to him about it. But you know, it isn't the boy who is guilty. It is the parents. It is your responsibility as a father to see he is on time. Please look after it. The sharpness of her tone surprised me. Irina Georgievna was a short woman with wispy brown hair and a kind of uncertain look. She wore a large wool scarf over her shoulders like a shawl she had taught for many years. A couple of days before school opened, when we had gone over to meet the teachers and see the classrooms. She had been friendly and comforting to Jenny, who was overwhelmed at going to a strange school in a strange language. But in the classroom, Irina Georgievna was anything but Meek and mild, she was a firm disciplinarian, whether dealing with her 30 to 40 students or with their parents, whom she addressed in the same authoritarian manner as her second graders. Semyonova N. was her next target. More shyly, this time, a mother's hand went up. It was mostly mothers who were there, only a couple of fathers. Irina Georgievna held up a notebook and turned the pages slowly for all to see. Look at this, she said. Here and there, I could see an empty page, a scrawl, an ink blot, 
one page ripped out and pasted in again. This is very bad work. Arina Georgievna scolded, and this is typical of your Nadia. She is messy. Do you allow her to leave messes at home? Can she just throw her clothes anywhere? Here you see, and she pointed out what she regarded as an offensive page. She writes wherever she pleases on the page. That particular page did not look so bad to me, but looking more closely I could see that the child's letters were not all evenly placed on the lines, though the work was legible and otherwise reasonably neat for an eight-year-old. My God, I winced inwardly. What is she going to say about poor Jenny, who can barely read and write in Russian? Irina Zhurjevna spared us a personal critique, but she did not spare the Russian parents one after another. She found fault with her children at school or in their home upbringing. Kir Yuk M. Hin, she called out. He talks constantly in class. He is always bothering the others. He can't stop talking. Then she mentioned another girl by name. Oh, she's a bright girl, but she cannot sit still, cannot sit straight. She wiggles all the time. Another boy was not only behaving badly in class, she said, but he was arriving home at 3 or 3.30 in the afternoon. A couple of hours after second grade was out, this meant she declared disapprovingly that the parents did not know what he was doing, did not follow his behavior. She went through a list of a dozen more children and concluded by saying, I have a request for the parents of these children. Please put them in order. Finally, Irina Georgievna went to her desk and came back toward the cowed group of parents with a miscellaneous collection of small balls, strings, parts of plastic airplanes and tanks, and one open knife with a hefty four-inch blade like a fish knife. These things were confiscated in class from your children, she remonstrated. Then she held up the knife for all to see. What is the second grade boy doing with such a knife in school, playing with it in class, she demanded. Silence. The parents accepted her bawling out without complaint, protest, or explanation, acknowledging guilt by acquiescence and not challenging her authority. From Russian friends, we heard that such criticism sessions were a regular ritual, dreaded and yet paradoxically looked forward to by both parents and children as source of considerable gossip. Afterward, as both parents and children swapped stories from family to family about what the homeroom teacher said about everyone, upstairs in the sixth grade, the atmosphere was less tense. By the time we arrived, Natalia Ivanovna, a pleasant, oval-faced blonde, had finished her child-by-child -child critique and was explaining the new geometry and algebra to parents, some of whom were evidently out of their depth trying to understand their children's homework. Firmly, she cautioned parents against doing the actual work for their children and urged them only to check it over afterward but her manner was that of a friendly counselor, not a martinet. Once we had sat down among the others, she reminded them there was an American girl in the class and gave a public critique of Laurie's academic work. It was even-handed, a balance between a frank assessment of Laurie's early shyness and a modest compliment on her more recent race citation of algebraic definitions. Lori's grades were posted publicly on the bulletin board. <clears throat> board, along with everyone else's, according to the customary Soviet practice, in this class, the main bone of contention was that the art teacher had given out a lot of twos, flunking Ds in the highest grade in Soviet schools for what she considered sloppy work. One father complained that the teacher was being too strict in making children 
marking children down for not using a certain kind of graph paper that was then unavailable in stores. Natalia Ivanovna sympathized, but no marks were changed. In the larger school-wide parents' assembly, a visiting lecturer from a teacher's college told parents they should pay more attention to their children's television listening habits. It sounded like something out of Scarsdale, a bad idea to ban television entirely, but equally had to be totally permissive. He recommended not only imposing time limits, but also watching some programs with children and discussing them afterward to make television an educational family activity. When he finished, one father rose to complain that they were that there were very few programs for children under 14, and those few that did exist were shown too early for working parents to follow his advice. Other parents' heads nodded, and after some discussion, the principal, Mikhail Petrovich Martinov, stare steered the meeting back to the school's real concerns. Kids not doing homework, discipline problems, the need for parental cooperation. He did not go into details, but Lori and Jenny told us that spitballs and shooting paper airplanes behind the teacher's back is as normal for Russian boys as Americans. Girls got their long hair dunked in inkwells and fought back by jabbing the boys with sewing needles. Smoking was strictly forbidden, but the boys' toilet during recess, Lori said, was known for its mushroom cloud of smoke. The principal, a balding grandfatherly man with steel-rimmed spectacles and a pleasant smile, was not so stern as the second grade teacher had been, but I could hardly help reflecting on how different were the entire set of relationships from an American PTA meeting where parents go proudly to see their children's work posted on bulletin boards and to hear heartwarming praise of their progeny from homeroom teachers and where if anyone raises public complaints it is usually parents upset with the principal. I later learned that some Russian parents like Americans do work in class committees with teachers on discipline problems or such projects as helping poor children get textbooks. Moreover, as the brief dialogue about television illustrated better, educated Soviet parents are less intimidated than earlier generations by educational experts or school officials and occasionally speak up at parents' meetings. At one Moscow school, a Russian friend recalled a mother who had the nerve to ask why the principal, also a history teacher, had been instructing history classes that Christ was one of the gods of Greek mythology. What are you attacking him for? defensively muttered a babushka nearby. There are different theories. Overall, however, the first that first parents' meeting introduced us to several essentials of Soviet educational philosophy. The technique of public shaming for misbehavior or poor performance, brutal as it seemed to us, is central to the Soviet system, whether in bringing up children or making adults toe the line in any walk of life. From an early age, all learned the futility of arguing back with authority of disputing public criticism as the passivity of the parents indicated. What is more, everyone seemed to accept the idea that school is supposed to know best about bringing up children and that teachers should coach families and set standards for them, not vice versa. A sharp dichotomy exists nonetheless between the supervised rule-ridden lives of children in school and the lax atmosphere at home where children are pampered, spoiled, and protected. 
at heart Russians are soft on children, a common rationale which I have heard from officials again and again is that children must be given privileged treatment because they are our future. That real reason, I suspect, is more emotional. <clears throat> Russians are moved by sentimentality to dote on their children. They envy and fancy the innocence of childhood. At the farmer's market, the collective farm women love to give free flowers and other little gifts to Leslie, our three-year-old, while they chucked her under the chin and muttered endearments to her. Stern customs inspectors would mellow at the sight of our children and let us pass sometimes without a check. Waitresses in restaurants, ignoring other customers, would stop and make a fuss over children. Once we arrived in Leningrad by car from Helsinki, and the hotel administrator could not find a record of our room reservation. Although it was well past dinner time and we were hungry, she told us to wait while she handled a group of 70 students who had arrived after us. But when I plopped Leslie on the counter, another room clerk immediately took pity on us. Olga, she gushed, they have a little one. Rooms were hurriedly found. This tendency has an official side, too. <clears throat> At collective farms I visited, the nursery was often the brightest and certainly the cleanest spot on the premises. An obligatory stop on the official tour of the farm because the powers that be were so proud of it. In the oil town of Almateyevsk, I was taken with a delegation of foreign newsmen to the pioneer camp of the local oil trust, also one of its proudest installations, and justifiably, for it was a pleasant, secluded, well-kept hideaway in the woods, in Murmansk, where, for two months, the sun does not rise during the long Arctic winter night. I was told that children were given top priority for fresh food, vitamins, and sun lamp treatments. At nursery kindergarten, number 101, Anne and I watched one group of toddlers strip down to undershorts, don goggles, and then, like players in a children's game, line their toes on a chalked circle. All right, children, clucked Dr. Tamara Ponomarova, hands over your head, and 15 pairs of hands wriggled in the air while bare tummies were bathed in the eerie iridescence from the ultraviolet sun lamp in the center of the circle. It's dark in here, objected one tot with a hair bow, tugging at her sunglasses. Masha cautioned a white-gowned matron, don't take off your glasses. In a jiffy, they were turned around to be toasted lightly on the back side. The treatments, I was told, ran up to six or eight minutes a day as depth of winter, and in the dining room, the cooks showed us the little shredded carrot salads and the slice of fresh lemon for tea given to the children. We saved the best for the children, Dr. Ponomorova advised me. They are our future. At home, family life practically revolves around children, especially when they are small. So many urban families have only one child that all the possessive physical affection and intrusive fussing of Russian parents is focused on the one little creature. They treat us like dolls rather than people, whined one unusually independent 14-year-old. This boy wanted to be more adult, but most children bask in the spoiling given them. We had a language teacher who adored to dress up her little two-year-old Lisa in pleated skirts and to put white organdy bows in her hair. The father indulged Lisa with an extravagant array of stuffed animals and dolls, many of them imported, the kind of luxury he much more sparingly allowed himself and his wife. 
a Russian art historian with one daughter, tried to distinguish between Russian spoiling and American spoiling of children. You let your children do as they please, and we give them what they please, this woman said, and our children grow up selfish. Many times it is because the parents have had a hard life and they want their children to live better. But the children come to expect it and they do not appreciate it. I know a woman who works in three different places so she can have the money to buy her daughter the best clothes. The mother herself dresses very plainly. She takes nothing for herself but the daughter thinks she must have the latest of everything and she is not even grateful. In other families, children get the choiciest portion of good food. If there is any extra on the table, it is always put aside for them. Indeed, one family we knew, very well off because of the father's high position in a ministry, allotted black caviar to the six-year-old boy almost daily. Typically, for a small boy, he balked at the taste, while adults in the household salivated enviously, but all accepted the tradition of giving the best to the youngest. Along with this spoiling goes lavish potential parental overprotectiveness. In its most obvious manifestation is the fetish for overdressing children to go outdoors. They are transformed into walking cabbages, stuffed with layer upon layer of oversized sweaters under a surrounding leaf of fur coat two sizes too large and around it all a scarf tied like a ribbon at the midriff. I never quite understood how these ambulatory balls of humanity got much exercise, but the parental sense of protection was satisfied, and in the parks I have seen many a babushka poised on a bench ready to jerk a small body to its feet if its wayward rump should accidentally settle into the sand of a sandbox. All Russian toddlers have to master the art of squatting to avoid the cold touch of Mother Earth that so worries their elders. When small fry play in the snow, parents hover over them protectively. When seven, eight, or nine-year-olds walk to school, along goes the babushka, who usually lingers to take off their outer garments at school. It was striking to me how rarely we saw children under 10 or 11 in public without some adult, and Russian parents were surprised that we allowed Jenny at 8 or 9 to ride the bus alone or with Scott, who was 5 or 6, even if only for a few stops to the American Embassy. But let a child somehow get lost and Russians take communal responsibility for it. Friendly, protective hands materialize in a moment. Once in Gorky Park, when we were ice skating on a small rink, a Russian mother rushed from a bench to gather up little Leslie, who had been left to play in the snow at rink side, though still where we could easily watch her. As Anne skated back, the Russian woman waved her away and volunteered herself as a babysitter for half an hour seating Leslie on her lap and amusing Leslie with her own children so that Anne could enjoy skating. At home, parental protectiveness usually spares children from household chores. An auburn-haired journalist I knew was chagrined by the paradox. At school, she said her 16-year-old daughter took care of her clothes, carried her tray in the cafeteria, took turns with other children dusting, washing up windows, and cleaning up classrooms or the playground. But at home, Masha doesn't do anything, this mother told me. She comes home, sits at the table, and expects to be waited on. I told my mother to let her wash her own clothes, but mother made up some excuse. Masha does such a terrible job. It's easier for me to do it myself. It's the babushkas who spoil them the most. A Russian engineer, a father of three, called it a kind of Jewish spoiling. We fear for our children that they won't be healthy. They'll go off to the army. 
that some misfortune will befall them because we have seen so many hardships ourselves. Let some family encourage self-reliance by arranging for a teenager to get a paying job and the community disapproves. A scientist told me about a doctor's family where the parents got their daughter a summer job as a clerk in a telegraph office. The girl was pleased, but when word got around to family friends, they considered it so shameful of the parents to make a youngster work that they hounded the parents until the girl quit the job. The envelope of family protectiveness also makes Russian school children more dependent on their families than American children and less obsessed with the cult of their peers, though it is changing. School-age children have fewer games and diversions outside the home than in the West and are often thrown back on their families for entertainment. It is true that in summer, millions go off to pioneer camps, which vary in quality as greatly as adult institutions. The best camps, like stores for privileged adults, are very impressive and hard to get into. More ordinary camps, I was told by a couple of boys, are pretty boring. And rule ridden. My auburn haired journalist friend explaining why her daughter didn't go said that in summer children want relief from the discipline, and at those camps they have to live by the bell with exercises and activities all on schedule. In the long fall and winter months, entertainment can be more of a problem. The circus, puppet theater, and children's theaters are very popular as is ice skating in the parks. Another big hit is the movie and television cartoon series, New Pogod, Hey, Wait a Minute, in which an evil wolf chases a lovable rabbit through all kinds of ridiculous escapades. Our children liked it as much as the Roadrunner cartoons in America, but pickings are slim compared to the West, and public facilities are far too few to handle more than a fraction of the demand. A Soviet diplomat just back from Washington, whom I encountered accidentally one day out picnicking with his family in the woods, volunteered to me how bored his children were with Soviet television and how meager the park and playground equipment seemed to them in Moscow, which has the best the Soviet Union has to offer. Perhaps less well-traveled children did not notice so much. The smaller ones play in courtyards outside, but older ones have a hard time finding the independence that youngsters seek around 12 or 13. The weather forces them indoors, and they automatically become an appendage of the adult circle. No matter what age they are, children are usually taken along as a matter of course, which their parents go out to call so that their own social lives are mainly as part of the family group listening to adults. Sometimes the close living in Soviet apartments makes for emotional and explosive disciplining, I was told, but the Russian families we knew were quite permissive. Several times I saw children act fresh, come and go haphazardly from the table, ignore repeated parental requests to eat, to be quiet, to sit still, and the parents let it go. I remember one seven-year-old child who spent an hour jumping on and off a chair, and a bed only a few feet from the dinner table where we were eating and her family thought nothing of it, nor is this just laxity in a few random families. A Moscow kindergarten director asserted to me that one major justification for Soviet kindergartens was to socialize only children spoiled at home. A grade school teacher in Latvia told me that the conflict between family permissiveness and strict school discipline often causes tensions among children who miss kindergarten. This young woman was as critical of the rigidity in schools as of the laxity in homes. 
If the horse has been galloping fast and free, she said, you can't stop him all of a sudden. Letting go of their children is something Russians find hard. The first day of school outside the red brick school number 30, where our children went, was a scene of such excitement and emotions that it reminded me of Americans sending children off to camp for their first prolonged absence, rather than the mere surrender of youngsters for a few hours. Fathers climbed on window sills and stood on their tiptoes to get snapshots of the children all lined up outside in the courtyard, class by class in front of their teachers. Mothers shouted advice. Finally, the principal made a speech and the children marched into school. Not a few mothers were crying, and I even came across an army captain around the corner of the building, wiping away tears. The Russian parents simply could not tear themselves from the school and began peering in windows. Please, parents of first-year students, don't put more pressure on your children, the principal pleaded over a bullhorn. They are already excited. Please go home. Don't stay here. The windows. Let them start the first lessons in a quiet atmosphere. People in the Soviet Union today still have the idealistic reverence for education that Americans had before the urban school crisis of the 60s spawned disillusionment. Along with Communist Party membership, education is one of the two main avenues for moving up in Soviet society. It is still popularly regarded as a great social leveler, though, as in America, reality is far from that ideal. But the first six decades have produced impressive educational achievements in mass terms from an illiteracy rate of about 75% and a school enrollment of 10 million before the revolution. The Soviet Union had moved close to full literacy and roughly 50 million children in its schools. Nor are those merely abstract statistics. I remember a toothy little Tajik peasant named Sultan Merkalov on a state farm outside the Shandvi, whose family embodied the educational transformation that had taken place in three generations. John Shaw of Time Magazine and I were taken to his home during an official tour and given a feast of lamb pilaf and local wines, served on the traditional raised outdoor dinner table typical of Central Asian homes. We were sitting as cross-legged as our poor, unaccustomed western legs would permit, while Mikhailov told us about his father, who had been a poverty-stricken, illiterate sharecropper before the revolution. But now, he said, seven of his eight children had received high school or college education, and the eighth, who was eleven, would do so, too. Then, with great pride, he announced that at 54, he himself had been inspired by his children's example to go back to school. He was taking a correspondence course in viniculture and other subjects, and he said with a chuckle, My children help me with my homework. Yet, in spite of such achievements, stark inequities remain. The 1970 census showed that more than half of all Soviet adults had gone no further than 7th grade, and only 50, only 5.5% had any education beyond high school. Also, in spite of a nationally standardized core, curriculum set in Moscow, variations in the quality of Soviet education are so great that both Soviet and Western scholars now suspect that the educational system 
is rigidifying and reinforcing the class structure of Soviet society. The very top schools are half a dozen specialized FISMOT, physics, mathematics schools, patterned after the Bronx High School of Science in New York and reflecting the high prestige of science in the Soviet system. At one school in Novosibirsk, I was told 300 whiz kids from all over Siberia are admitted annually out of a million who begin an academic Olympiad that selects the most promising talent. Like similarly competitive science schools in Moscow, Leningrad, and Kiev, this one tapped university professors as teachers and experimented with methods <clears throat> far more flexible and stimulating than in ordinary schools. As a special question in one quiz, the rector told me a teacher had asked students to propose substitutes for the internal combustion engine. In five minutes, one 14-year-old had come up with three ideas, two so practical that adult Soviet scientists were already exploring them. At the affiliated club of young technicians, adults were pushing the far-out imagination of these bright youngsters to inventions. One lad had produced his own small laser machine. Another had devised an elaborate hydraulic push-me-pull-me Push me, pull you, machine for skimming across Siberian swamplands without getting stuck. Elsewhere, a few teachers' colleges run selective experimental classes where marking is done away with. We knew a family who were delighted to have their daughter in an experimental school where children were allowed to argue with each other in class and occasionally allowed to lead the class in place of the teacher, something un unheard of in normal schools. At the other extreme are poor staffed and equipped rural schools, provincial schools which sometimes run on two and three shifts because of overcrowding, or the roughest schools in worker districts, some of which were described to me by Russian teachers as Soviet blackboard jungles. Vasily, a dedicated young math teacher in Moscow, workers' district school, told me that 15 of his 80 eighth graders had medical slips classifying them as mentally retarded or having a mental disability that excused them from exams or in some cases attending school at all. Dead souls, he called them sadly. Along with a portion of able students, Vasily said he had many others who could not keep up with homework partly because of broken families or alcoholism at home. Still, he faced severe pressure from the school administration to pass all but one or two because of the official drive to claim that all children were getting secondary education, even if in name only. Completion of 8th grade became the compulsory level nationwide in 73. So bad is the atmosphere in some blue-collar schools, I was told, that teachers will endure an inconvenient, time-consuming commute in order to keep jobs in the older, better schools in central Moscow, rather than accept transfers to working-class schools closer to their homes. Practically all of my students are illiterate, but I closed my eyes to that, I was told by Nedya, a middle-aged woman who taught literature to 8th and ninth grade classes in Moscow, blue-collar schools, for years. Out of 40 students, I always have 5 or 6 boys who fight all the time, smoke and drink. They are real hooligans. They get into gang robberies and some of the girls get pregnant. I had one 15-year-old <clears throat> year old girl last year who was in school for only half a year and was convicted of prostitution, but you can't give flunking grades because the principal wants to fill the quota for passing students. It has to get 98-99%. If the principals don't fill that norm, they get reprimanded. One teacher was fired a year ago 
for giving too many failing grades. The students know that. They will tell you right out, you cannot fail me. Once I gave a C to one pretty good student and he was upset. Why do you give me a C when you give a C to that other guy who knows absolutely nothing, he asked me. I told him I want to pass that other boy out of 8th grade so he can leave school altogether. Then next year I can teach you and the others who really want to learn. What she meant was that after 8th grade, poor students drop out completely or shunted off to vacational schools. This has become a touchy issue. Periodically, the press runs unhappy letters from parents complaining that there are not enough places in 9th and 10th grades, college preparatory levels for the 8th graders. In our own neighborhood, children took a week of exams in 8th grade, to be classified for specialties, and weaker ones were diverted into vocational schools, including one around the corner that trained garment workers. The problem has become increasingly acute because Soviet authorities have made a great push over the past decade to increase enrollment in high schools, ninth and 10th grade, without expanding higher education institutions to match. Now, the state and many parents are in conflict, the state needing more well-qualified blue-collar workers and the parents intent on getting their children higher education and the more prestigious jobs that go with it. What has apparently happened is that the Soviet intelligentsia has now become large enough to replenish itself, a change from the long period when revolution Civil war, purges, and world war wiped out so many people that the state always needed fresh blood from below. Now, well-heeled parents who have their eyes on the Soviet equivalent of the Ivy League, Moscow State University, Leningrad State University, or a few other prestigious universities or institutes, make great efforts to place their children in special schools. These, like the one our children attended, offer special courses in English, German, French, Spanish, the sciences, or music, starting as early as second grade, plus a better caliber of general education, since big city Soviet schools run straight through from grade 1 to grade 10 in one building. Entrance is essential from the start. Technically, special schools are, serve geographical districts like others, but they do not accept all comers. Quietly, they weed out slow learners by giving unofficial entrance tests. Some neighbors told us that at our school, number 30 prospective first graders were asked to read from a book, though Normally, preschool reading instruction is not given in kindergarten. To recite nursery rhymes, tell some fables, and to describe the different seasons. To grease the kids, many parents use influence and gifts to school principals to get their children enrolled in these schools if they live outside the neighborhood. The class consciousness of parents and sometimes the antagonisms between blue-collar workers and the intelligentsia passed by osmosis to children. We knew a family who lived in a cooperative apartment building occupied by what Soviets called the intelligentsia. Americans would call it the middle class. Engineers, scientists, army officers, educated people. Around them were all blue-collar workers, apartment buildings, the lifestyles in the two groups, our friend said, was quite different. The talk among workers was about sports. The children were pointed toward sports clubs, and lights went out at 10.30. In the cooperative, people took greater interest in culture, gave their children music lessons, and lights burned until midnight. Socially, the two groups mixed little. 
nor did our friends or other Russians know of more than a few isolated marriages across class lines. Children from the two sets of families went to the same neighborhood school, but from an early age they had different aspirations. Workers' children expected to finish high school and become taxi drivers, policemen or factory workers, and intellectuals. Children expected to go to college. There are exceptions, of course, said our friend, a systems analyst, but basically there are two groups, and everyone knows to which he belongs. The children almost never invite home children from the other group. They sense the social difference. When they play together, they are enemies. Then he paused, considering that too strong a word. Rivals, I suggested. No rivals is not strong enough, he countered. Something between enemies and rivals. In any case, the children in the other buildings think of the children in our building as coming from the intelligentsia. They assume they are richer and they look up to them. Whatever the differences, one common denominator is the collectivist political indoctrination to which all children are exposed in nursery, kindergarten, or school. Academic instruction may vary, but not social character training. The objective of educational work in socialist society is the formation of a convinced collectivist, a person who does not think of himself outside society. A leading pedagogical manual asserted in 74, the formation of communist all people morals is the unifying foundation of the requirements for teaching children. In other words, the main precept of Soviet child psychology is that by creating the proper group atmosphere, the school ensures that children will grow up properly. Leonid Vladimirov, a former Soviet journalist who defected, explained that children at the tender age of three or four develop political antennae from the upbringers in their nurseries. The young boy or girl gradually acquires what is an extremely important faculty in Soviet society. He develops an understanding of which questions one can ask or discuss and which ones must be avoided. Vladimirov wrote, Beyond that, youngsters are instilled with a conformist collectivist zeal. The greatest offense a child can commit in kindergarten is to be different, observed Vladimirov. Few nations make it easy for the individual who wants to swim against the current of prevailing mores, but the Soviet Union makes it almost impossible. The kindergartners that I visited, which Russian friends said were way above average, were usually bright, pleasant places, well stocked with toys, plants growing in some corner, and a smiling, benevolent portrait of Uncle Lenin in almost every room. There the children learned to play and work together, even to look after disciplining each other under the warm but firm maternalism of the upbringers. In Murmansk, at kindergarten nursery number 101, I saw one group of toddlers where the tea tables were perfectly set up for all the dolls. When the children started to play, large women in white gowns enveloped one child after another and guided them in warm tones where to sit, how to sit, how to handle the dolls, how to play in general. Although this instructing, countermanding, and supervising was done with obvious affection, it seemed bound to smoother initiative and spontaneity. The children could hardly move without some instruction. Jean Ipsa, a young American child psychologist who was doing research at Moscow nurseries, was also struck by this very warm but intrusive guidance. Psychologically, it makes the kids very dependent because they don't want to lose the warmth by doing something wrong, she said. At Moscow Kindergarten Nursery, number 104, the director, Lydia Alec, Zandra Agareva described to me how older children play scenario games where the teacher manages them from the start. 
arranging the games to teach the ethic of collective cooperation, and if a child was selfish or misbehaved badly, I asked, the punishment, she said, is usually exclusion from the game and ostracism from the group. Although our five-year-old son, Scott, spent only about three months in Soviet kindergarten, we had an opportunity to notice the friendly but enforced conformism there. On one occasion, the children were being disciplined collectively for a good hour by having to sit still in their chairs. On another occasion, Anne came home talking about both the neatness and the uniformity of the artwork. Twenty little children made clay rabbits, and every one of them is the same size, the same shape, the same position. You couldn't tell Scott's from Masha's or Misha's, she exclaimed in disbelief. Later, it was Daisy's, every picture showing the flower in the same position, with the same number of petals, <clears throat> in the same colors, and with the same three leaves on the stem. In Georgia, we saw an art exhibit by ten-year-olds, decorative, colorful, well-drawn, and the space well-used, but there, too, no trace of individuality or spontaneity in concept or technique. In vain, we looked for those artistic fantasies that most children love, this was socialist realism in miniature. The children were obviously imitating a teacher's model or each other. One subject which little Soviet children are forbidden to draw, a former nursery teacher told me, is Lenin. He is too sacred, she said, and they draw too badly. The political content of nursery, kindergarten, and school propaganda, especially based on Lenin, staggers most Western Westerners. Russians say it is less oppressive and crude than under Stalin when children used to be instructed to scratch out the eyes or blacken the textbook portraits of high officials as they fell victim to Stalin's purges, used to sing worshipful hymns to the dictator, or at the peak of the Cold War learned slogan ditties against the West Stalin is candy, Roosevelt is yuck, Churchill is crap, the words rhyme in Russian. Now the emphasis is on patriotism and Lenin worship. One Soviet reader begins not with Dick and Jane prose, but with assertion. The first country of socialism in the world became the first country of children's happiness in the world. From two or three upward, Children are immersed in songs, games, and little holiday performances filled with red flags, scarlet banners, red stars, and paeans to the October Revolution and the motherland. Best in the world, one young Muscovite I knew recalled a kindergarten song in his childhood about a child who finds a button, gives it to a border guard, and that helps catch a foreign spy. With the obvious moral about avoiding foreigners, that song was missing from one current children's songbook given to me, but among patriotic songs, there was a heroic little tune about the border guard, always on duty, eyeing ravines where an enemy might be lurking, ready to repel the foe. Unlike the Stalinist era, no living leader is idolized. All affection is focused on Lenin. Two- and three-year-olds, teachers are told in their manuals, should be taught to recognize, love and respect Lenin's portrait. Four- and five-year-olds to decorate paintings of Lenin with ribbons and flowers on holidays, and six-year-olds to lay flowers at his statue in their hometown. The innumerable songs about Lenin give him the aura of a combined George Washington, Santa Claus, and Christ figure, the most perfect human who ever lived, and in the words of one tune, always the best friend of children. Some songs imagine him coming back to life, playing hide-and-seek, picking strawberries, bouncing 
children on his knee and the children loving him better than their own grandfathers, telling him, we want to be like you in every way. Not surprisingly, this political conditioning is heavy stuff. I have listened to eager young children in an American Armenian village, Baku, Moscow, or Murmansk, enthusiastically singing about Lenin. Our own Scott came home one day to announce that the Tsar was like the English king, but Lenin's team was stronger and Lenin won. When I mentioned this to a Soviet diplomat, he smilingly replied, Give us time, we'll make a Bolshevik of him. A four-year-old nephew of some Russian friends, very excited one evening by holiday fireworks, asked his mother if he could shout. She agreed, and this tot piped out with, Glory to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, a kindergarten outlet for holiday excitement. A writer told me he was mildly amused one day when his three-year-old daughter admonished him, Uncle Lenin says to brush your teeth every day, not the way you do, but when he tried to use Lenin to reinforce family discipline, it backfired. He warned his daughter to behave, or Uncle Lenin will eat you up. Evidently, the daughter carried word back to the teacher, for she contacted the mother and humorously remonstrated that this was no way to talk about Lenin to children. But the biggest jolt came to a Swedish couple who had sent their six-year-old son to Soviet kindergarten, trying to assert paternal authority over him one day. They asked him what grown-up he respected. Instead of naming mother or father first, he said, Lenin. Well, after that, who? And the boy went right down the line through the Soviet political hierarchy, from Brezhnev to the district Communist Party secretary, without mentioning his parents. The sense of collective responsibility, disciplining, and group activities begun in kindergarten is carried forward through the school years, in the classroom, and in succession of children's organizations. The Octoberist, Young Pioneers, and Komsomol, the Pioneers 9-14, to have a Boy Scout, Girl Scout ethic of doing good deeds for the school. and community except that their indoctrination and activities usually have an ample political quotient, reaching a crescendo around communist holidays. A scientist in his mid-twenties recalled his passion as an 11-year-old pioneer for the romantic revolutionism of books about a youth named Timur and his gang that somehow mingled a feeling of links with the Red Army and its fight against fascism during World War II, to the gang's secret good deeds, recovering stray goats, helping foil bad boys who stole apples, and watching over the homes of women whose men had gone off to war. Now, Tamur gangs have been institutionalized to promote self-sacrificing, patriotic collective exploits among youth, I remember how horrified I was, the scientist went on, when I learned that capitalists encourage their children to make money by doing little odd jobs. I still find that unattractive. Once I was in downtown Moscow when some Americans asked me for directions. From school, I understood a little English, and I led them to the building where they were going. I was very offended when they offered me a tip. The classic pioneer hero and martyr is Pavel Morozov, a 14-year-old who in 1932 reported on his own father for hiding grain from the state during the harsh period of farm collectivization. The boy was murdered by private farmers who opposed collectivization. He was later immortalized by the party. Pavel Morozov is less vigorously celebrated now than under Stalin, but the code of young pioneers still promotes not only civic duty but political consciousness among youth. A pioneer is loyal to his motherland, the party communism. A pioneer has the heroes of the struggle 
and work as his models. A pioneer keeps the memory of the fallen fighters and prepares to become a defender of the motherland. Many Soviet classrooms have a so-called system of self-discipline which amounts in practice to institutionalized tattling in which one child known as the Zvenonvi or leader of a link reports to the teacher on the conduct of children in his row. Lori and Jenny said this was not done in their classes but it did go on in other schools. One Russian mother described the system to me this way. Each morning the teacher asks for a report and first one Zivonny gets up and says, Sasha came to school late today, and the second reports, Nadia did not finish her homework, and the third, Petya was fighting with Marina and has a dirty shirt. Under another scheme known as Sheftezvo, the best students are designated by the teacher to help weaker ones with classroom work or homework. Lori used to help Russian children with their English lessons and vice versa, though they did this out of friendship rather than because of encouragement by the teacher, so far as she knew. The Sheftevzvo and Zvenzon, Zvenovoi systems have greatly impressed some American educators, most notably Yuri Bron Finbrenner, whose book Two Worlds of Childhood, Us and USSR, makes much of the collective responsibility Soviet children take for each other. Bron Finbrenner also favorably cited the practice of older children in Komsomol student councils summoning errant youngsters, such as a group of boys who went swimming one evening without supervision and punishing them. In real life, these systems work less ideally than in the model situations which Ron Finbrenner was shown. According to Soviet parents and children, most youngsters, especially those over 10, roundly dislike the Zven Novois and sometimes beat them up at recess for tattling. Others regard the behavior of model students who get an ego kick out of helping teachers or weaker students as very much like teachers' pets anywhere in the world, girls being more zealous about it than boys. The unique Soviet element is that many teachers encourage children to report on each other's conduct and try to institutionalize the practice. They are training little informers, said one mother bitterly. In lower grades it works, but by the time children are 11 or 12, our friend said, most children refuse to cooperate. My own impression, moreover, is that Braun Finbrenner, prime examples including the Komsomol Student Council, were really disciplinary techniques manipulated by adult authorities, coaching and using children as proxies rather than student democracy and self-initiated responsibility at work. Children don't initiate organized punishment of each other, one mother said in answer to my questions. They go to those Komsomol council meetings the way adults go to their meeting. They can't not go, so they go and take their cue from the leader. They sense what is expected of them and they do it. Generally, Soviet youngsters are more law-abiding than American children, but in my view this is primarily because they have been taught from nursery upward to submit to authority. The obvious discipline problems that crop up by the time Soviet children reach 12 or 13 suggest that values of self-discipline have not been internalized in the absence of authority or st strong group pressures to keep them in line. The corruption and furative rule-breaking in adult society would tend to confirm this. At school number 30, not only did our children notice classroom misbehavior behind teachers' backs and smoking in the toilets, 
but rather brazen cheating in class and the practice of teachers looking, locking classrooms during recess to keep better control of children. Russian parents told us of similar precautions at their schools and teachers complained privately about discipline problems. They complained of difficulties with hooky, occasional vandalism, drinking, and what the Soviets loosely term hooliganism. From time to time, the press carried articles that hard drinking as well as smoking begins around 14, that illegal radio hooligans young ham operators interfere with government channels, and that juvenile crime is a problem. There are never broad enough statistics printed to allow comparisons with other countries. I would guess that juvenile problems are growing but are not yet as severe as in America. During a candid morning with Alexander Semeyosov, deputy mayor of the Siberian city of Ratsk, I learned that among his city's major headaches were car thefts, radio hooliganism, and delinquency among 14 to 16 year olds. He told me the police force was being expanded with university graduates to try to cope with the most troublesome youngsters in a more sophisticated way. The problem of bringing up the young is everywhere. He confessed with rare candor for a Soviet official. You have it, and we do too. Academically, Soviet schools start late but move fast, much faster than early grades in American public schools. Children do not enter school until age seven, and at kindergarten, they normally get little or no instruction in the three R's. The first years quickly make up for that. A Soviet school reform in 1970 compressed work formally done in four years into three. By the year end of second grade, our Jenny had been exposed to the lower multiplication tables, some short division, number sets, algebraic concepts, and other elements of the new math. Russian parents we knew were groaning at their inability to understand their children's homework, let alone help with it. We found the reading, grammar, and penmanship impressive. So rapidly do Russian children move along that most American children transferring into Russian system normally go back a grade, and this puts them in with their normal age group. One reason for the rapid progress we discovered is the workload. Schools run six days a week from September 1st to May 30th, with very short holiday periods. Lori and Jenny found the homework load heavy, and not just because they were foreigners. Russian children work hard too. I take about four hours a night, and that is normal for good students, a bright and conscientious 16-year-old told me. The poorer students have to work longer, I guess. Frankly, I guess not from the, uh, what the silly the teacher in the blue collar school said Lori put in a good four hours including language tutoring and homework sessions with one friend Marina without whose help she would hardly have survived in the early months Russian parents have complained about the overload and even some Soviet pedagogues have wondered aloud in public whether the accelerated pace was causing tensions, illness, and possibly impairing eyesight, but most students cope somehow. The classroom atmosphere seems deliberately to overcompensate for the sentimental indulgence of Russian families in home life. Our girls were immediately told they could wear no rings, jewelry, or cosmetics, and we were advised to cut their hair or keep it well combed back. Russian boys said that some instructors objected to Western haircuts and fashions. The uniforms lent the flavor of what I would imagine in an Imperial German gymnasium, which was where Stalin supposedly obtained the heart of the Soviet curriculum, 
or a strict American parochial or military school, nothing could be further from individual-oriented trends of American education in recent years, and general schools' elective divs are out of the question. Lori's sixth grade had a dozen set subjects, math, physics, biology, Russian literature, Russian grammar, Russian medieval history, geography, English drawing, singing, physical culture, and work, sewing for girls, shop for boys. The emphasis was on drill, 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 and straight memory work, often unchanged for generations. In literature, for example, Lori struggled to memorize a passage from Gogol that her 26-year-old language tutor and our 55-year-old office translator had both memorized in their day. What a wonder is the Dnepr River in tranquil weather when smoothly and freely it speeds its generous waters through forest, hills, and dales. Not only did algebra require memorizing rules, definitions, and theorems to be regurgitated letter perfect in class, but singing required memorizing verses of Pushkin. Written work was monitored with the finicky strictness of a French lycée. Lycée. The younger children worked not with pencils and erasers or even ballpoint pens, but with fountain pens, and as Irina Georgievna demonstrated in her lecture to parents, one blot in the copybook was as heinous a sin as in David Copperfield's day. Lori submitted a drawing once for art that had taken her an hour and a half and the teacher rejected it because the pen line was too thick. It had to be done over. Blackboard notes recopied in students' notebooks must reflect exactly the capitals, indentations, underlining, and double underlining of the teacher's original, or students are marked down. You have to line up your books and notebooks at the upper right-hand corner of your desk the edges in line with the front and side of your desk, said Jenny. Lori told us that Russian teachers did not like children going to the bathroom during class, but permitted it only during recess, and you can't just get up and go to the pencil sharpener or get a drink of water if you're thirsty the way we could in Washington, where she last went to school, she said. You are supposed to do that during the class breaks. American parents who worry that American schools are too achievement-oriented would boggle at the success ethic and failure phobia of the Soviet system. Performance is gauged almost daily in every subject. When children are called on to recite their homework, other children often whisper helping words and phrases, and some teachers wink at the practice, and the daily grade goes in the book. Our children were amused that this mark mania extended even to physical culture, where Jenny said her second grade class was graded on somersaults and tumbling. For the most part, little is done in Soviet schools to liven up classes. In the schools we visited, Anne, who is a former teacher, and I looked in vain for book corners or science tables and projects where students could work or dabble at their own pace. In Vermont and Baku, I saw high school science classes, which consisted of rote recitation, lecturing by the teacher or by his doing an experiment in front of the class although there was a separate science study room. I did not see enough lab equipment for the pupils to learn by doing. Their role was passive. Vasily, the young math teacher in the blue-collar school, said dialogues in his classes were rare. Students almost never asked questions, he said. Russian parents confirmed 
that their children's classes were teacher dominated. In an American school, sometimes you wander off the subject and get into a discussion that is interesting, Lori com commented after her year was over, but it seemed as though that never happened in Russian school. You know how you can have some games, like spelling bees or mathematical puzzles or games. Well, that they don't do that. I don't want to leave the impression that the institutional life of Russian children is entirely bleak and cheerless. In big cities like Moscow, Leningrad, Novosibirsk, I saw impressively equipped pioneer palaces or clubs of young technicians where the most fortunate and energetic youngsters could join radio programs, make up their own inventions, film movies, go through mock training, and exercise for cosmonauts, study animals, or stuff birds. The big trade union federation, the army, the police, and other organizations sponsor sports clubs for youngsters. One uniquely Soviet institution is the sports school where potential athletes are selected at an early age and given daily training for sports careers. In the central Asian city of Thorns, I visited a swimming school for 700 children where the coaches applied sink or swim tests to first graders and took only those who kept afloat and looked well coordinated. As a rule, swimming champions are 14 or 15 years old, so we pay attention to developing sports among children. I was told by Alexander Koms, the director of the Franz Agricultural Machinery Plant, which sponsored the school. A coach explained that out of 1,500 children who try out annually for the school, less than 1 in 10 is admitted. Then they swim an hour or more daily, all through school and more during vacations. The same thing is done for soccer track and field or hockey players and other athletes. Difficulty for most children is that such schools and the programs of the big sports clubs handle only a privileged minority. For the rest, the diversions from academic life are more limited. The positive side of the no-nonsense Soviet approach to classroom education is that great, great gobs of materials are committed to memory and children are drilled to mastery of fundamentals in subjects like math and the natural sciences, which lend themselves to that method in the early years. Results are impressive. Lori learned so much in a year of Russian school where she half skipped a grade that she coasted for the next full year in mathematics in the Anglo-American Embassy School in Moscow. Another correspondent son, Stephen Shabad, who attended the same school, number 30, for four years in the 60s, found himself excellently prepared in math and sciences when he entered Columbia University, but the way, but way behind in essay writing and the humanities. For the cost of the stifling conservatism of the Soviet method is in the lost spontaneity of students and in the Soviet system's failure to teach them to think creatively for themselves or to ask imaginative probing questions. In sixth grade math, Lori's homework included a heavy dose of complex, intricate exercises that tested her ability in all the mechanical tasks she was supposed to master, but word problems were almost unknown. In class discussions, even at higher grades, precious little time or effort, if any, was devoted to Socratic dialogue. Nadia, the literature teacher, remarked that many Soviet teachers thought they were helping pupils to think independently and creatively, but in fact they did the opposite. 
both she and others told us that the emphasis was on giving right answers. This can be a problem anywhere, but it seems far more acute in Soviet schools because their authoritarian approach is aimed, as one teacher's manual put it, at correcting unfounded ideas, debunking incorrect, mistaken conceptions. The humanities, especially history, which treats the past, and particularly the Russian past, as one long, inelectable prelude to the glorious era of Soviet rule, are taught with simplistic ideological rigidity. The course of history at the secondary school must bring home to pupils that the downfall of capitalism and the victory of communism are inevitable, and disclose consistently the role of the popular masses as the true makers of history. One Soviet syllabus asserted, Stephen Shabad told me that in his days in Soviet high school, we had one teacher in history who used to say, don't look in the book, think, 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 but she didn't mean think for yourself. She meant think, remember what you have been taught. The problem of rote learning has bothered not only a few maverick teachers and iconoclastic parents whom I happen to meet, but prominent Soviet educators as well. Periodically, the press, especially the Writers' Union Weekly, Literary Gazette, has carried fairly tart critiques of Soviet scholars for the mechanical stuffing of students with facts and figures that leaves them ill-prepared for university or modern application of their knowledge. Mikhail Prokolovlev, the Soviet Minister of Education, scorned Soviet high schools in the late 60s for drenching students with memory work and leaving no scope for reasonable initiative. One of the primary impulses of the 1970 educational reform, undertaken ironically as an answer to the American reforms that followed, the American panic after Sputnik in 1957, was the desire to break out of the mechanical teaching methods. One of its chief prophets, Leonid Zankov, a senior member of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, wrote a book called Conversations with Teachers, designed to show that children were far more ready for inventive, analytical, inductive teaching than most teachers thought. His more flexible approach was adopted in some schools, but the unrelieved complaints of parents and a few outspoken educators in the mid-70s indicated that the reforms had not really made much of a dent. Indeed, just before I left Moscow at the end of 1974, the assistant dean of Moscow State University's philology faculty lamented in the press that literature candidates were unhappily subjecting the classics of Chekhov and Pushkin to the schematized stereotypes of the class struggle because of the way literature was taught in Soviet schools. Probably the sharpest blow to the spirit of educational reform and experimentation in recent years was the emasculation of Psy Mat School No. 2 in Moscow in 71-72 through 72 as one of the half-dozen elite schools for young scientific geniuses. It had flourished for several years, not only feeding top students into the best universities, but regularly placing winners in nationwide student Olympiads. Prominent scientists and other scholars had worked without pay in many cases to develop an experimental curriculum. To a Westerner, the curriculum would not seem especially innovative, but to the Soviets it was a daring departure. University professors taught classes, I was told by former students, and to their parents that the school developed genuine intellectual ferment unique in Soviet secondary schools. One teenager said he had even discussed Solensin's 
works with other students and informally with one unusually liberal and daring teacher. According to the Chronicle of Current Events, an unofficial human rights publication put out by dissident scientists and intellectuals until its suppression in 73, students excelled in establishments of higher education not only by virtue of their high-level grounding in physics and mathematics, but also because of their love of literature, their keen interest in social problems, the nature of the questions they asked lecturers in ideological disciplines, and their habit of not taking on trust anything that had not been proven. Applications to the school soared to three or four times the number of places available. As the logical extension of some of the educational reform theories, the intellectual climate at the school obviously troubled Communist Party conservatives. The percentage of Jewish students was very high, and so was the proportion of Jewish scholars on the faculty, according to my Moscow friends. When in early 71, one of the teachers, I. K. H. Zivonsky, applied to immigrate to Israel, the authorities moved in on the school and began administrative harassments. According to Igor, a tall, lanky recent graduate, the pretext for administrative inspections was that New Year's Eve 71 had been celebrated with a roulette game. Another pretext, he said, was that a group of students had visited the Jewish synagogue in Moscow and would have gotten away without trouble for the school except that one boy wrote the school's initials on a fence near the synagogue. Purges of the faculty and student body were carried out in spring 71 and again a year later. In one action, the director and three assistants were fired. Later, teachers of history and literature were forced out, an indication that the real reason for the purge was ideological. Several other teachers, I was told, resigned in protest to these firings. Marxist-Leninist indoctrination courses were stiffened, and students who did poorly in those fields, no matter how talented in science, were called on the carpet and outside lectures by university professors dwindled to nothing. By fall 72, the previous flood of applicants had fallen off, and in Igor's words, this once elite school had become a spiritless, gray, sor <coughs> sorry spectacle. One of the unique qualities of this school, I was told by several people, young and old, was that in its prime it had not been not only a place of academic experimentation and excellence, but of unusual candor and confidence between students and teachers. More typically, several intellectual families privately told us children learn quite early in life about the schizophrenic split between talking freely at home but carefully conforming and concealing their views in public. Any family whose level of education is high enough to have many books at home talks differently at home than beyond the walls of its home, and the children can feel it, says Vasily, the young math teacher. Maybe no one tells children specifically not to speak out, but they are canny, and they learn the cynicism from their parents. Nadia, the literature teacher, acknowledged it too. We are part of official life, she said. Once children pass beyond the innocence of those first years, when they will do anything a teacher says, they watch what they say in front of their teachers. In rare cases where children in innocent naivety buck the political values of the system, it has a way of backfiring. I knew a 16-year-old boy, a quiet, artistic, independent lad, who told some school friends that he did not plan to join the Komsomol, Young Communist League, though it is virtually obligatory for all. His father was a Communist Party member. Though passive and unenthusiastic, he knew nothing of the incident until being summoned to school the next day by the homeroom teacher, whom the family regarded as a flexible and sympathetic lady. 
She told the father what had been reported to her by another student. I would rather not know this, she said, itself an unusually liberal mark for a Soviet teacher who was supposed to take seriously the party's exhortations to monitor the moral upbringing of her students. But you know this can be a serious matter. You are an intelligent and sophisticated father. Tell the boy that he can think what he wants, but he cannot say what he wants. So the boy joined the Komsomol. Poignant as that was, I was even more touched by an, by an incident that affected another family in which the father was an establishment figure of some rank with a good official job. Somehow, he and his wife had obtained a copy of Salentian's August 1914, and their teenage son found it at home. It was a time when the book was under sharp attack in the Soviet press. At school, the boy's literature teacher had denounced Salentian and that book specifically. The teacher said it was very bad. It is anti-Soviet, and the West picks up everything that is anti-Soviet. The boy said to his father, shrewdly adding, Don't we pick up everything that is anti-Western? The son wanted to read the book at home, but the parents forbade it. The father told me he had sternly warned his son not to let anyone know that his parents had the book or that they had discussed it. I have to choose between lying to my son about what we read and what we think or teaching him to lie said this man in a moment of searing honesty i prefer to be honest with our son i love him he will never be happy because he will understand too much but at least he will not grow up like a stupid ass